afternoon. Well, good evening. Uh, so tonight we're going to be putting matters of the status of the country in regard to cancer prevalence. Statistics indicate that uh, at least nine persons lose their women, especially lose their lives on account of HPV. That is uh, cervical cancer. While nine out of ten those who contract or cervical cancer actually succumb to the disease. Tonight, the status of uh, matters of uh, cancer are going to be put into perspective. And our guest tonight is none other than Dr. Miriam Mutebi, who is a chairperson of the Kenya Society of Hematology and oncology uh, abbreviated as kesho thank you very much ma'am for your time thank you let's so start much. us from there let's know where are we as a country when it comes to cancer prevalence um so i think one of the first things that we do need to keep in mind regina is we are actually in the middle of what we call a syndemic which is basically a constellation of very many different pandemics we've just recently come off the um covid and we're seeing an emergence of both non-communicable diseases and cancer especially and if we look at uh data from the recent commission on just um, cancer in sub-saharan africa what we do see is that over the last 30 years our numbers have doubled and um, uh, what should be more alarming is by 2020, if we look at the numbers, we saw that half a million um, um, Africans died as a result of their cancer. And um, what should really give us a call to arms is that if left unchecked, this number is likely to double by 2030. Sort of circling closer to home, we see that um, the patients that who are diagnosed every year tend to be around about 42,000 patients. And again, um, what we do see as well is a very high, what we call incidence to mortality ratio, um, meaning that patients who are diagnosed um, die from their cancer. So we see about 27,000 deaths. Uh, however, at any one time, we have about um, 82,000 patients uh, living with a diagnosis uh, of cancer. And uh, I would say in the last um, 10 years or so, we have seen considerable increases in terms of availability of, of cancer services. I think we do need to acknowledge um, the couple of strides that have been made over the last 10 years. One, we have a very rich um, policy as relates to both uh, um, defining um, screening guidelines, treatment guidelines for cancer patients, and more recently over the um, pandemic, we have um, recently launched a palliative care policy and palliative and supportive care. Um, we've seen an increase in the number of uh, cancer services available. Um, we've seen a development of both uh, regional uh, centers that provide cancer services, whether it's surgery, chemotherapy. We now have 11 centers in the country where one can receive both um, surgery and chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And we've seen an expansion or decentralization of uh, radiotherapy services. What used to happen 10 years ago is everyone uh, from across the country would have to go to the main tertiary referral in Nairobi at Kenyatta that to receive. That is the Kenyatta National exactly, exactly. Hospital. Now this has been devolved, exactly. somewhat devolved to the region. Precisely. Maybe you can just give us a breakdown because what we have noticed in some of the challenges in regard to, you know, access is the issue of awareness. Where do I seek medical attention? Maybe you can break it down to just uh, give us where we have these regional centers across the country. Sure. Um, so, so far we have the main, uh, keep in mind we have both public and private and really there's opportunities and um, um, uh, areas to think about how can we, you know, um, develop our, co our collective strengths. And so in terms of the uh, public facilities, we do have uh, the main uh, referral centers, that's a Kenyatta Hospital, um, the Kenya, um, Kenyatta Teaching and Referral, uh, University Teaching and Referral. We have the Mombasa um, Comprehensive Cancer Center. We have, uh, we've recently introduced radiotherapy services as well in both Nakuru and Garissa. So really trying um, to ensure that um, this access continues and they are planned to upgrade uh, several centers over the next couple of years mm -hmm. but I think um, and you did highlight one of the key areas Regina is that the challenge is despite these ongoing efforts um, the majority of our patients are still diagnosed with advanced disease and frequently do not complete their care and if we do a deeper dive into the reasons behind this we see a constellation of factors one the fact that uh, patients have to pay out of pocket in order for them to access care I would say we've seen 
considerable improvement in the number of patients who are completing their um, cancer journey just as a result of the National Hospital Insurance Fund starting to support some of the costs of care. But because, quite, uh, because cancer care is expensive anywhere in the world, then you still find that the patients who have what you have what we call financial toxicity or catastrophic health expenditure, meaning that they have to sell things and sometimes are not able to complete their care. Mm -hmm. If we look, sorry. No, <laughs> yes. Now, before we look at, you know, the, the cost of mm -hmm. care, maybe you can, from where you sit, tell us, um, you know, uh, given the data and the yeah. research that uh, you have undertaken, what are, you know, what is, most, what is the most prevalent uh, form of cancer within our country? Because we know research is done in yes. Africa and globally, and we have different data. Yeah. But then what is, what are we suffering from when it comes to sick sure, cancer? Sure, sure. Um, if we look at the um, prevalence of cancers uh, in Kenya, and this is from the um, Global Cancer Repository, where we uh, look at data that's supplied by our two cancer registries that are in, um, in Nairobi and Eldoret, we see that the top cancers in Kenya are breast cancer, followed closely by cervical cancer, uh, prostate cancer, and then esophageal and um, colorectal cancers are the top five cancers mm -hmm. um, in the country. Okay. Um, of course, we do have under-reporting because we don't necessarily have um, a uh, national cancer registry, but those are part of the ongoing efforts that are being done by the National Cancer Control Program to really and the cancer registry team to ensure that we're actually able to capture a true sense of what's going on. Now, talking the about capturing the true sense of what is happening on ground. Yeah. Let's talk about research because without research, we'll not have the requisite data uh, to help us, you know, come up with policy as well as also interventions that are tailor made for the country. What do you think? Have we done enough to ensure that we have localized research that is going to influence, you know, treatment of cancers that are prevalent in the country? Yeah, I think, Regina, we're just merely scheming the surface. Um, we're looking at uh, some of the data that we did really more on a global level, looking at uh, where do we lie in terms of cancer research. And what we realize is that if we look at a continent, um, Africa is a continent, we see that um, we are only, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that is, is only contributing, um, cancer research specifically is only 8% of the burden of, I mean, of the bulk of research that's coming out. And then we break it down further, we're saying in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're only contributing 14% of that research. Now, sort of driving closer to home, we see that um, we are definitely having um, over a, we've done some preliminary data and looking at just over the last 12 years how much research has been generated and what we've seen is that um, we've had about 700 publications which is just really looking at research and uh, uh, pub dissemination of research we've seen around 700 papers roughly um, what should at least give us a bit more drive is 40% of those have been um, had a Kenyan author or a mm -hmm. researcher. Mm -hmm. However, only 91 of those papers were prominently, like I would say, um, Kenyan driven, Kenyan meaning driven. that we are deciding on the research questions and the research um, and the research uh, topics. But that really speaks to the underlying problem, which is a lack of funding and uh, development in research. So are you saying it is not enough, that we're not contributing enough, or we are not investing enough as a country towards research that is tailor-made for us when we talk about matters of cancer, Dr. Harry? Absolutely. I think uh, we're only starting to see um, a, an increase. One, I would say let's acknowledge one if we look at what's happened over the last 10 years you would say if we looked at uh, two th by 2007 we had about nine papers on cancer by 2021 we had over 100 papers a year on cancer which definitely shows there's an increase but if we look at the um, in terms of the funding or um, resources available for uh, res not just cancer research but research in general uh, we see that I think by 2012 uh, there was a resolution by the African Union um, countries to devote at least 1% of their um, GDP towards research and development. And so uh, part of the call from us is from the uh, um, oncology fraternity is if we could even just have 10% of that towards um, re cancer research, we would go a long way because what's mm -hmm. happening is because we do not drive our own agenda, then the agenda is determined by um, external funders. And so, you, I mean, whoever pays the piper is the one yeah. 
yes, call the tune <laughs> exactly. to the tune. And we are talking about exactly. where we are when looking at the prevalence. Exactly. So from where you sit, let me understand is that you're saying that we have not done enough to ensure that we have the requisite budgetary allocation uh, to fund a research that would now in turn influence policy implementation uh, to tackle the issue that is cancer. So from where you sit, what recommendations would you have to streamline the issue of research in the country when it comes to cancer? I think we need to acknowledge the role of our academic institutions. Um, academic institutions should be given the autonomy to uh, source for funding and actually have um, be able to drive their own agenda because they're not they're probably we have I think one of the greatest um, levels of collaboration in uh, the East African region if you look at um, who's funding our research we have a really good collaborative base but until we put our money where our mouth is for want of a better word then we're not necessarily going to be able to um, mm -hmm. drive the agenda and driving the agenda doesn't mean just providing funding it's where is the expertise uh, if we look at our disease burden for instance we say the majority of our patients are diagnosed uh, with advanced um, cancers so we we need to look at what are the supportive needs of our patients, what are the patient journeys, how do we interrogate, what are the challenges our patients are going through and then design interventions to do that. Mm -hmm. and to, in order to do that effectively, you do need a skill set. It's not just um, the um, actual researcher. It's you know the person handling the you know the grant uh, the granting that's been funded. It's you know the um, the um, economist guy who's looking at is this cost effective because we do need to look at value based care. We can't afford to just throw money at things. We have to think about what strategies can we have. And it has to start from somewhere because exactly. we tend to believe exactly. that there are some forms of cancer that are. Otherwise, preventive. Let's to look at uh, HPV. Uh, the government worked, I think, two years back to actually roll out a campaign to encourage persons and actually parents to have their children vaccinated against HPV. From where is it within the value chain? Has it been taken up? Um, I think there has been a moderate uptake. However, some of the challenges that exist uh, have really been around uh, myths and misconceptions. And that's really part of the, um, we did talk about the financing, but we haven't talked about one of the major barriers to access to care, which is really the social cultural barriers that exist. And this is because quite a number of uh, myths and misconceptions have been associated with uh, HPV. Whereas we know that uh, most people, um, most adults, certainly by the time uh, uh, ladies getting to um, most women getting to 50 have had at least exposure 80, 80 to 90 percent of the population have been exposed to HPV but what happens is that for most people they're able to clear that um, they're able to clear the, the, the virus um, successfully. However, it's only in a uh, certain co uh, cohort where it actually progresses to cervical cancers. However, when we talk about HPV vaccines, there's always that, uh, is this going to you know, be encourage um, mm -hmm. indiscriminate sexual behavior? Or are we you know, having a judgment call around uh, sexuality? So we really need to start to have these conversations in open spaces. We, we've known from the data that HPV does not necessarily increase um, your or, um, risk of um, sexual I mean partners or whatever but it's looking at if you look at the risk versus benefit because people sometimes have worries about fertility or will this affect my fertility none of that uh, has actually been proven and we do know that the vaccine is safe and it does uh, reduce the risk of um, cervical cancer in people who've been vaccinated by up to 90 percent and this is a largely preventable um, illness and so really in terms of looking at how do we strategize around this it's not just a um, health perspective it's really around education and Department because as much as we're talking about demystifying and de um, uh, stigmatizing some of these, it really comes down to what is the literacy level in the population. Um, again, beyond literacy, what are the patients able to understand or what are the population able to understand about the benefits? But beyond that, how do they then um, have the agency or um, economic wherewithal to actually access care? Because um, it's not just enough to have the HPV vaccine. You do need to go for screening. But then that then brings in the case, how do I then, you know, prioritize screening? Because one, is it our health-seeking behavior? Because uh, as you and I know, Regina, sometimes the, the narrative that we have in many of our communities is, why am I going to look for trouble? Yes, if I am exactly. not actually bedridden, exactly. I do not need to be at the doctor's Precisely. Uh, Precisely. consultation room. So what, as uh, the Kenya Society of Hematology and Oncology uh, Organization, as you are, what are you doing to increase awareness? Because what I'm hearing right now is that we have so many interventions out there, but the public remains generally underexposed in regard to 
what is out there and how can they seek these interventions that are out there yeah what are you doing so the kenya society for hematology and oncology um has been working uh closely with the national cancer control program and this has been basically uh, as part of supporting the technical working groups this is around defining um guidelines and uh, guidelines for treatment guidelines for screening guidelines for supportive care but also looking beyond that to how do we then educate because one of the barriers that we haven't talked about as well is the health system itself where we know that on average uh, um patients will see four to six healthcare providers regina before definitive diagnosis of their cancer is made so it's really ab about thinking about our broader communities even before we go um to um um to the to the lady on the ground we do need to make sure that if she's able to go to a health syst system or a health center the health, the physician is or healthcare provider should be provider. able to actually identify exactly. what she's ailing absolutely. From, absolutely from the onset absolutely. and talking about accessing that particular medical facility we are currently uh going through the budget making process yeah. is this an avenue in which one jico or other the citizenry can actually use to employ the government to bring or rather to come up with policy regulations that are going to bring the cost of care you know cancer treatment and care down is this an avenue that the citizen we can explore absolutely absolutely i think there's an opportunity for i would say collective this is really a call to arms for everyone because we all have opportunities to make a difference in our patients lives and sometimes we think about advocacy as just talking about um you know increasing the funding but it's all these different aspects that exist uh patients are currently dis getting discriminated on a day to day basis um they're uh, having legal uh, whatever where they're getting terminated because you know the employers are saying um you know you're already you, terminally ill you're exactly, not giving us the exactly, value for our exactly, money exactly or you're such. having so many sick days yeah. so how do we build the legislature that actually protects uh patients or anyone who's suffering from a chronic illness we then think about how do we then you know um increase or think about uh the funding um because right now we're supporting treatment uh we're not necessarily um as invested in supporting the um screening aspects and whereas we're saying it's not an infinite kitty but how do we start to think collectively where the economists when we need them where the um 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 clinicians who can all come together and sit down and say let's have a conversation mm -hmm. around how we can provide value based care which is not only quality but is also cost effective and so there's definitely um different avenues that we can push uh we do know that um in in countries that have universal healthcare coverage the outcomes of uh, not just cancers but any other chronic diseases are actually much better and so if we thinking about how do we mobilize um how do we push for um change because it's not just sometimes we think about let's push for cancer mm -hmm. let's push for um let's push for you know kidney disease let's push for no 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 we're saying let's come together and imp and push for better health services because health is our basic right mm -hmm. and we should each as um we should all be able to access timely affordable care and that is really one of the functions of government that they should be able to provide that for us mm -hmm. and so we really have an opportunity to push and see how we can help to make a difference now the cancer summit is set for in the less than you know a fortnight or so between the 2nd and the 4th of february from where is it person who who is you know embroiled in all this within the valley chain as you say what are your expectations of this cancer summit in regard to the theme of this year and also where we are as a country looking at the prevalence rate as well as the mortality rate where cancer is concerned yeah. i think i'm really excited about um this upcoming conference because uh we had our own um kenya international cancer conference um just in december last year and um we were really looking at how do we have a multidisciplinary approach to care and how do we look at use innovations and i think this is the next step to that in the sense of we have a um multi-sectoral uh, multi-stakeholder um 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 audience our participation and people who you wouldn't traditionally think about in the sort of health space and so you're looking at how do we get as i was saying the economists on the table yes. how do we get the manufacturers because we're saying cancer care is expensive drugs are expensive well, why aren't we manufacturing our own why aren't we manufacturing our own health commodities mm -hmm. what are the innovations and technologies that we can use in order for us uh to improve care and so it's really having that conversation where the educationists because unless we educate our women and girls 
uh, and teach them you need to have agency over your body, you need to go for regular screening, you need to get a vaccine, they're not necessarily going to be able to have that conversation. So it's really around how do we get the whole community, as it were, mm -hmm. um, and of course the financiers, because at the end of the day, this has to make financial sense, and we have to think about how do we develop sustainable models. And so that's really the ethos of what we're hoping to achieve. So I know it's shooting for the stars, but I think just having that conversation and really having that continuing engagement is really going to go a long way towards us trying to solve some of our, our problems. Mm -hmm. Off the cuff, whenever someone or a family member is actually diagnosed with cancer, usually they come in with stigma and they thought that, hey, we are already going to lose this person. But from where you sit, I know you're, you, you're a medical practitioner, you're an oncologist and such. And uh, tonight would want to assure Kenyans the question is, do we have the requisite capacity in terms of equipment, in terms of medical, you know, uh, in terms of drugs, as well as human resource to actually cure or treat cancer locally without having to think of, hey, I'm taking my person to India, I have to do a harambe because this person needs to seek metal, medical health out of the country. Mm -hmm. Do we have the capacity to treat cancer here within our borders? Absolutely. I think... Um as I said, over the last 10 years, we've definitely seen an expansion in services. Um, one of the things as a breast cancer surgeon and a cancer researcher as well is, um, has been that, uh, as you said, the stigma around cancer equals death. However, we do know, and this is why we're really trying to push the preventative um, care agenda, mm -hmm. is that um, er, cancers, if treated, if detected early and treated appropriately, are just like any other chronic illness. And not only are they treatable, they're potentially curable. And so um, the, the, real, the real drive is for early detection of our cancers. If we're able to pick them up early, um, we're able to uh, do less aggressive treatments, and we are, which of course is going to have less financial implications. So definitely earlier cancers are easier and cheaper to treat. Uh -huh. But then let me throw the spanner in the works. Yes. Like I go to the consultant, a physical, you know, a physician, because that's where we start. That is our point of entry. Mm -hmm. But by the time I actually am diagnosed and told that Regina, this is X, Y, Z, you're in stage two, to stage three of cancer. Mm -hmm. I have been going through the screenings and seeing these physicians, but they're not uh, they do not, I, I'm trying to avoid the word, they do not have the requisite capacity to tell me exactly what I am suffering from. I find myself over two, three years, I have been visiting this particular practitioner, but we have been treated for different, a different ailment altogether. Absolutely. So how do we rectify that? And so that's part of one of the um, areas that, as I said, as the Kenya Society for Hematology and Oncology, uh, we are working um, hard to um, try and ameliorate because what we do realize is that um, the skill sets exist but before the patient sees gets to the oncologist there's quite a number of barriers and so it's looking at how do we strengthen our primary health care um, uh, primary health care uh, physicians and health care providers and there's been lots of concerted efforts not just from Kesho but also from the National Cancer Control Program uh, to train um, community health care providers community health care uh, physicians on the common signs and symptoms we've now tried to incorporate innovations to that where there's now M. Saratani there's apps there's if you mm -hmm. have bundles you get online or download it to look at what the common signs and symptoms but then also beyond that it's looking at how do you strengthen the system because as soon as you pick up a diagnosis and what are the patient referral pathways and that's what has been critical in trying to figure out strengthening that is going to be critical in ensuring that patients access timely um, and affordable care uh -huh. now in one one minute or so Let's bring this to a close. From where you sit, what do you think we need to do different to actually, you know, stem the prevalence of mortality when it comes to matters of cancer in the country? Dr. Ari. Um, I think there's that has several levels mm -hmm. <laughs> as it were but um, from a policy level we do need to really push for early detection and um, uh, early detection and prevention and early detection from a community level we do need to raise the awareness not just among healthcare providers but also the community around the basic signs and symptoms but then from an individual level we do need to think about um, how do we change our own health seeking behavior somebody uh, made the remark that um, for those who drive that they treat we treat our cars better 
better than we treat our, our, our bodies. Our <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because every couple of hours you take, I mean, every couple of miles you take it in for a service, whereas for our bodies you wait for the body to break down and then you take it to the hospital. So it's really about changing our health-seeking behavior, but not also being a little more nuanced in the sense that um, I would say being our brothers and sisters keepers. So if it's not just taking charge of your health, but also empowering the people around you um, to have those conversations around health and going for regular checks and screening. Um, in terms of um, decreasing a risk from a personal level, we do know that diet and exercise do go a long way towards not necessarily preventing, but definitely minimizing the risk. Mm -hmm. So I would say these preventative lifestyle strategies, diet and exercise, screening where appropriate, will and again, really just moving the community along with you will definitely go a long way towards us trying to shift the narrative. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Our guest tonight has been none other than Dr. Miriam Mutebe, who is the chairperson of the Kenya Society of Hematology and Oncology, uh, abbreviated as Kesho. Her word tonight is that we need to change our health seeking behavior as well as think preventative that rather than you know curative in regard to matters of cancer that brings us close to a conversation on cancer tonight given that we are expecting to have a summit a national cancer summit to be held next month between the second and fourth where various stakeholders are going to be converging to talk about you know the cancer burden and the interventions therein Thank you very much, ma'am, for your time. But now let's cross over to Matter Sports. And I know if you're an 